Your next candidate was the former superintendent of the Denver Public Schools until he was appointed to the United States Senate in 2009 and elected in 2010. He's the former chair of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee and the senior senator from the great state of Colorado. Please welcome Senator Michael Bennett. Two minutes of opening remarks. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm, I am Michael Bennett. <clears throat> As the introduction said, I was the superintendent of the Denver Public Schools before uh, I was in this job. And I know what it takes to get up on a Sunday morning, so I want to say I deeply appreciate the fact that everybody is here. Thank you for coming. And I just want to say briefly that when students come to see me in Washington, middle school students and high school students, and they take a tour of the Capitol, um, there's a tendency for people to think that all of it was just there. The White House was just there. The Supreme Court was just there. Um, and of course, none of it was just there. It, it all sprung from the imagination of people uh, that we call the founders who created this Republic of the United States of America 230 years ago. And it has been the work of Americans since then, people who sat in seats just like the ones you're sitting in, who were freshmen and sophomores and juniors and seniors in high school, who saw it as their job to make this country more democratic, more fair, and more free, because it has never been perfect, and every generation of Americans has had to see it as their job to make it better. And that is your job. Whatever your political beliefs are, that is your job. And that is my job. And as a former school superintendent, I can tell you, I believe the number one thing we need to be doing is making sure that we leave more opportunity, not less, to the generation that's coming after us. That's all of you. And for reasons we'll talk about today, there are a lot of ways in which you are being left the short end of the stick by my generation, so you cannot get here fast enough. The work you can do in your community to lift up people that are already working hard to make your community better can give you the skills you need to be able to be a United States Senator someday or run a company or a farm or a ranch. But that, that chance to give, contribute to the community is a contribution to the country. I, reward, I, I congratulate you, really, for being here today because I think the stakes in this election are huge. That's why I'm running for president. I want to make sure that we are not the first generation of Americans to leave less to the generation coming after us. I'm Michael Bennett. Thanks for having me this morning. Now, Senator Bennett, uh, we're going to start out with the same question that every candidate will receive today. Uh, when registering to attend this event, almost 57% of students reported that they'd be eligible to vote in the 2020 election, uh, yet only 44% of them said that they planned to. Uh, if you win the Democratic nomination, what will you do to engage America's youth and increase voter participation? So, great question. One of the, one of, I have a long reform agenda that includes doing things like overturning Citizens United, which was a Supreme Court decision that has flooded our politics with money. We've got to get rid of it. Banning members of Congress from ever becoming lobbyists and ending political gerrymandering. But a huge part of what I'm also trying to do uh, is encourage people to vote. That's why I've called for and I would try to pass legislation that automatically registered people when they were 18 years old so they could vote. It made sure that when people were 16, that they understood that they had the right to vote when they were 18, and that, ma that made sure that Election Day wasn't just one day. In Colorado, we have three weeks to return our ballots, and we get mail ballots, and there's no voter fraud, and our voter participation is the second highest in the nation. If Amy Klobuchar shows up today, she'll tell you Minnesota is number one. But there's a lot you can do, and I'll stop with this. There's a ton you can do. If you ask me the one thing that you could do, between now and the election day that would make a difference, no matter what your political affiliation is, it's making sure that every single person in this country who's eligible to vote is registered to vote and gets to the polls on election day. That's something you guys can do, and I hope you will. Now, make, make, make Theodore Roosevelt High School the highest percentage voting school in the United States of America. You could do that and show the, show the country. Your first audience question is going to come from Tom Bush. He's a student at Drake University here in Des Moines. Hi, Tom. Good morning. With the ever-growing presence of automation sweeping the nation and replacing jobs, how do you ensure that the millions of Americans whose jobs, whose jobs will be automated won't be left in the dust? 
What a phenomenal question. So you should know, first of all, and you may know this, that we haven't even done a good job responding to the last wave of innovation, the wave of innovation that existed before these kids were born, uh, much less get ready for the one that's coming that you're talking about. There are a bunch of things we could do in this economy to drive wages up when the economy grows, and that's stuff that I'm working on. But I have to say, and I'm not just saying this because I'm in a school, it happens to be true, Edging, educating people for the 21st century is the most important thing we can do to put them in a position to be able to take advantage of this artificial intelligence. There are going to be so many jobs replaced and there are going to be so many new jobs. And the only way you can prepare for that is by having the certainty of having a high quality education that gives you the skills and knowledge you need to be able to adapt and to be able to innovate. That's what I believe. Uh, so Senator, obviously, uh Reforming education feels like more of a long-term solution. Um, what do you say to the millions of adults in this country that since 2000 have lost their manufacturing jobs uh, but still have many years left in their career ahead of them? Well, I think, first of all, I think education is, shouldn't be long-term. To me, one of the great injustices in this country is that uh, our education system is reinforcing the income inequality we have rather than liberating people from it. And the zip code you're born into should not determine the education you, you get. And that's, that's an urgent, in my mind, that's an urgent problem, not a long-term problem. And education is a life, it needs to be lifelong learning. You know, we've got to have systems in this country of, of community college and college to retrain people who are, you know, later in life and to make sure they can get paid a living wage. I also have a number of bills that relate to that question, which is, you know, for too long, many of them in their 50s, people are working really hard, but they're not earning a wage that allows them to afford housing, health care, higher education, early childhood education. These are not nice to have. These are the building blocks of a middle class life. And we could change the tax code not only to make sure that when people worked hard, they got paid a living wage, but in my proposal would reduce childhood poverty in this country by 40%, eliminate $2 a day childhood poverty in the United States forever. So going a little bit back to the question though, for, you know, say you have some, so think of the, uh, the Iron Wall, obviously, which was lost to President Trump then in the 2016 election. Uh, many people in those states uh, held manufacturing jobs and they felt that he was right. uh, speaking to them. Um, you were speaking of education being a lifelong process. Uh, what short-term education programs would you instill um, for those people who are looking for their jobs? Well, I think there, the, there's, the, we can completely retool our community college system so that it actually is r responsive to the new needs of our economy. I think you're right to pull me back to the question because I didn't answer it very directly. I, I think also that in, a, in, 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 in places where we have lost manufacturing, there is the opportunity to onshore manufacturing. Energy prices in this country are much lower than they are in other places. China is beginning to increase its labor costs. And, um, and if we had uh, policies in place to actually uh, stop the, the deterioration of our manufacturing and our advanced manufacturing base, which we still are holding on to, I think we could put people back to work in some of these areas of the country. So thanks for pulling me back to the question. Uh, your next question will come from Haley DiGiacinto. She's a student here at Roosevelt High School. Good morning. Do you support subsidies and tax cuts for all electric car manufacturers like Tesla? Why or why not? I support the idea that every single uh, auto manufacturer in this country should be required to build an electric car so that every American in this country should have the opportunity to be able to buy an electric car. And in the short term, I do support tax credits for individuals who want to buy electric cars because I think we need to move ourselves into a cleaner energy environment. So you do it for individuals but not companies, correct? Uh, for individuals, yep. Okay. Uh, your next question will come from Nick McCrell. Uh, he's also a student here at Roosevelt. Nick? Hey, Nick. Hi. Um, I, my question is, do you support the effort advocated by Ted Cruz and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to enact a lifetime ban on lobbying by former members of Congress? Well, let, me, let me say this. I'm so irritated, not by your question, but the reality of what a terrible politician I am. For 10 years, I have had the bill, I just want to be clear about this, I have had the bill that bans members of Congress for life from ever becoming lobbyists. That's been my bill for 10 years. I could never get anybody on it until, because they all want to become lobbyists, until uh, a few years ago when I started to get some. 
and now Ted Cruz and AOC have arrived with their Twitter feeds to say this is a good idea. <laughs> so I would be happy to have them join my bill. That's what I'd be happy for them to do. Thank you. Now, uh, several politicians on both sides of the aisle have also advocated for term limits. Is that something that you would support? I don't actually support term limits because there are no term limits on the lobbyists. You know, I, I, and they will just stay there and they will build their they will build their influence even more. And I think that's why it's a very short-sighted, bad idea. Much better idea, overturn Citizens United, get the money out of our politics. Much better idea, end political gerrymandering so that politicians aren't picking their voters, voters are picking their politicians. And, an e and another great idea is a lifetime ban on members of Congress. And by the way, it's not just, that's not just political, it sounds kind of political. Over half the people that retire from the House and the Senate or I'm sorry, who leave the House and Senate and don't retire, become lobbyists in Washington, D.C. I think it's a terrible message that we're sending the American people. Uh, but don't you think that that influence uh, that a lot of these lobbyists have, don't you think that that somewhat correlates with politicians wanting to stay in power for longer? Don't you think that if there was a term limit of about eight years for a senator, then they wouldn't be bought as easily? I, I actually think that's the opposite is true. I think okay. that um, where, where both can be true, yes, some politicians, yeah, probably. But it takes a while to figure out how the place works, and especially when it's as messed up as it is today. I mean, I've been there for 10 years, and I finally understand how it works. Maybe I'm slower than some of these other people, but I doubt it very much. Uh, the, 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 and, and the other thing is there's been a lot of change. I mean, when I got there, I was, I was the youngest senator. I was 44 years old. Now there are a lot of younger senators than I am. And I was uh, 99th out of 100. Actually, Kirsten Gillibrand wrecked my Wikipedia page because <laughs> she got appointed a week after I was, and then I was no longer the youngest senator. But, but the place in so many ways is corrupt and unresponsive mm -hmm. to the American people. And the reality is today we got a bunch of people that have been there, for, or some people that have been there for a million years. Got a bunch of people like me that have been there for, you know, 10. I'm now 41st in the Senate. And then there's almost no middle management anymore, which is hard. I mean, I think that the voters need to help us here by p picking people and sending people to Washington who are responsive to voters, not to special interests, who are responsive to voters, not to lobbyists. And that's how I think we fix the system that we have. I have more confidence in the voters than I do in a kind of a ban on, or a term limit ban. Sure. Uh, your next question will come from Ellie Chunga. Uh. Hi, Senator Bennett. Uh, you are on record as supporting voluntary government buyback of military assault style weapons. What do you think, how, why do you think that voluntary buybacks will make a dent in the availability of those guns in mass shootings? Well, I also have supported a ban on the sale of new weapons, and I think the two of those together would make a dent. Uh, I don't support the mandatory buyback that some people, other people do, because I don't, I don't think that's something that the American people are interested in. But here's what I really believe. What I really believe is we have to pass background checks in this country. 90% of the American people support them. In Colorado, after the Columbine shooting, which was a high school shooting, one of the first ones, um, we pass background checks. And every year, as a result, of, and by the way, we're a Western state. We're a pro-Second Amendment state. Every year, two or 3% of the people that try to buy a gun in Colorado um, can't buy it because they're murderers and they're domestic abusers and they're felons. And uh, for the last 20 years, we've been trying to get such a law passed in the Senate, and we're now this close because the House of Representatives has passed it, and now all we have to do is get it onto the floor and get Mitch McConnell to put it on the floor and have a vote, and I think a majority would support it. So I hope that that is where people's attention are fo is focused right now. Let's get this background check bill done so that we can show we can actually make progress on this issue, and then let's talk about the other things that need to be done as well. Thank you. Uh, but Senator, do you really think that voluntary buybacks would leave a dent? Uh, why would a would-be shooter, for example, um, turn in his or her gun? 
They probably wouldn't, but the, the, but I but I but I don't I I hear that argument a lot. You know, well, you wouldn't have been able to prevent this, and you wouldn't able to be, be able to prevent that. You can't prevent anything. You are a hundred percent of things that happen. There are always going to be people, but that's different than saying would you be able to make a dent? Because there might be people who would have bought a new AR-15 who then won't be able to buy it because it's not available, and there may be somebody who gives up their gun who pre prevents an accidental shooting. I think the idea that you can't prevent every single you know, unpredictable outcome, uh, I don't think that should be a reason for not acting. Right, but if we think of, for example, Adam Lanza, uh, the shooter at Sandy Hook, right. uh, in that case, um, when you saw 21st graders shot, those guns that were used, uh, those were not newly bought. He'd had them in his That's home. That's true. So that but so, in a lot of other shootings, they are newly bought. Okay. You're right. This uh, is a, look, but this illustrates, this illustrates perfectly why our political system is such a freaking mess. Because the subtlety and the sophistication of your questions compared to the ones that we hear on the debate stage is unbelievable. It really, it truly is unbelievable. And these, these, these issues, these, no, almost none of these issues are are black and white. All, almost all of these issues are gray. And when you think about this, I just want to take a second before, because I know when you think about this, because I might get hit by a bus on the way out of here, so I want you to know what I'm about to tell you, and then you'll know it, and then I won't worry so much. When they set up this country, the founders of this country didn't set it up thinking we would agree with each other. That wasn't the point. They set it up thinking that we would disagree with each other because we were living in a free country. And they hoped that out of those disagreements, we would create more imaginative and more durable solutions than any king or tyrant could come up with on their own. That was the whole point. And I can tell you this, the older I get, the less I think I've got a monopoly on wisdom. It's not true for everybody I work with. The older they get, the more they think they're right. But it is that process that, that's so important. And so finding these subtle distinctions and these answers or in your questions is really what our democracy is supposed to be all about. And so I congratulate you and the rest of you for, for conducting a forum that's like 10,000 times better than the debate stage. Your next question. Your next question will come from Joseph Thome. Uh, he's a student here at Roosevelt. Uh, good morning. How do you plan to bring people out of poverty and keep unemployment as low as it has been under President Trump? Thank you. Um, I think the most important thing we could do to bring people out of poverty would be to adopt the proposal that I've made in this campaign. It's called the American Families Act. It is a very huge, large increase to the child tax credit. Requires no, not a single new federal bureaucrat to be added. That one change to our tax code, as I mentioned earlier, would cut childhood poverty in America by 40% and end $2 a day poverty in America. That's what we could do, and that is what we should do for the price of just 3% of Bernie's plan for Medicare for all, uh, we could do that. And I think, I think uh, our economy actually can improve far beyond what, it, what, it's, uh, what it's doing right now. We have had 40 years of uh, of an economy where incomes have been flat, but the costs of higher education, the costs of college, the costs of housing and healthcare have all gone through the roof, making it hard for people to, to live a middle class life and making it impossible for the kids in my old school district and their families to escape poverty. I think if we can create an economy where when the economy grows, everybody benefits from it, we'll be in even much better shape than we are today. So thank you. Your next question is from Zach Wallace. He's a student at East High School. Hello. So if the Senate remains in Republican control after the 2020 election, how will you get your agenda through Congress? That is a great question and is one that you should ask every candidate. I hope you will. Um, uh, if, the, if, the, if the majority in the Senate is still uh, under Republican control, I think what will be very important will be to propose an agenda that will unify America against a broken Washington. America's not, or Washington won't fix itself. You know, Mitch McConnell isn't open to compromise. Uh, we are going to have to close over him. And in the, if he's still there, 
what I will do as president is spend as much time in parts of this country where I only win 30 percent of the vote as I do where I win 70 percent of the vote, and staying there to explain my tax policies, my climate policies, my health care policies, so we can build um, momentum to overcome Washington. That's the only way it's ever been done. You know who led the last movement like this that I'm talking about? Teddy Roosevelt. He's mm -hmm. the one who led it. He led it. And they were, face, they, were facing, they were facing these huge trusts that make the big tech companies you know, look like small businesses compared to that. Mm -hmm. They were facing a world where women didn't have the right to vote, where they weren't talking about term limits. You know what they were talking about back then? They were talking about senators who were bribing state legislatures to send them to Washington so they could then send themselves railroad rights of way. That's what we were dealing with. And the American people amended the Constitution to change that and said, we're going to directly elect senators. I have mentioned, we're going, to direct, we're going to make sure women have the right to vote. That, this is another moment where we need that kind of a progressive agenda to overcome a broken Washington. If you don't think it can happen, it can happen. Look it up. See what they did during the progressive era. And that's what we're going to have to do again. You can't accept a bunch of people coming here and telling you you can't amend the Constitution. We can. If I'm president, I'm going to lead an effort in every one of the 50 states to overturn Citizens United. That's how strongly I feel about that. And, and you guys can start that work today. Uh, now, your final question is going to come from Caitlin Dean. Performing arts programs in schools nationwide are gradually being cut due to a lack of funding. As a former superintendent, you have had experience with this issue. What are your plans to support performing arts programs and activities? Great question. Thank you. Great way to end. So uh, I, I think arts are a vital part of any kid's well-rounded education and the ability for somebody as an adult to contribute to this society, even though I have literally zero artistic capability or ability <laughs> at all. Uh, all three of my daughters have been, attended a school in Denver called the Denver School of the Arts, which is a magnet school in our public school system. The two oldest ones graduated from that. I know how important that education has been to them. My daughter, Anne, who's here today, is a, is a, 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 takes ballet, and I know how important that is to her. Um, so we need to invest in education. That's the only way we're going to preserve these programs. And my parents and grandparents invested in public education in ways that we are not investing in your public education. We, we, that's one of the reasons why these art programs are being cut. It's why your teachers are paid so poorly. It's why, um, uh, it's why uh, unlike us, you've got to take 20 or 25 years worth of debt out to pay for your college education. None of that is fair. And, it, and all of that is reasons why you should be uh, active politically. Again, I don't care what party you're in. In fact, I'm not even interested in that. Uh, all I care about is that you're participating to be, so that you can answer your own question, which is, in our community, we are not going to allow you to cut arts and music from our curriculum. In our community, we're going to demand that you actually pay our teachers uh, well. And that as a country, we're going to come together and do it too, because the fun, it, this is not a moment for fun and games. I mean, think about this, and I'll get out of your hair because I know you have other candidates. Since 2001, we have cut taxes by $5 trillion in this country. We borrowed all that money from the Chinese. You're going to have to pay it all back. You guys are going to have to pay it all back. We borrowed $5 trillion from the Chinese to give wealthy people tax cuts. We've spent $5.6 trillion on these wars in the Middle East for the last 20 years. All of that has crowded out the investment in you. Because today, we're investing 35% less uh, in things like education than we were when Ronald Reagan was our president in 1980. You know? And you can't, at a certain point, a society can't move forward if it doesn't invest in the next generation. And so I can't tell you how, how grateful I am that, that you guys have done this today because it really is what's at stake in this election, and it's what's at stake in every election. Are we doing the right thing for the next generation? For that to work, you guys need to raise your voices. You have a couple of minutes if you'd like to offer closing remarks. I just, I, I want to say thank you. Again, I, I, it was such an honor to be here, and so grateful that all of you would take time out of your schedules in the middle of a weekend uh, to be here. And 
I really do believe our democracy is at stake. And I, it's not a secret that I didn't support Donald Trump. But when I say that our democracy is at stake, it's not about Donald Trump. I think he's a symptom of our issues. I don't think he's the essential cause. And he ran for the presidency saying, I alone can fix it. That's what he said. And in a country where the government seemed as broken as the government um, seems, and by the way, it is, it is, um, to a lot of people that seemed like an attractive answer because they thought, well, let's send a reality TV star to Washington. We can't possibly do any worse. Let's blow the place up. And what I can assure you is matters are worse. They're not better. And if we are going to solve issues like investments in our public education system, like having an economy that actually works for everybody so people can live a middle-class life and save, like dealing with climate change so that there's still a planet here for you guys to inherit, like dealing with paying our bills so that the debt isn't left to all of you. If we're going to do that, we're going to have to salvage our democracy. And that means, not, you know, that's not just about who's at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. That's about all of you and what you do. And I think you need to think of yourselves as founders, just like the people I mentioned at the beginning of this program, the people that wrote the Constitution, because whether you want the responsibility or not, that is your responsibility. And all of you are going to create this, recreate this democracy and recreate this republic. Not me. I'll help. I'm glad to help. But it's all of our responsibility. It's not I alone can fix it. It's what we as Americans are going to do. And being here this morning is a big step forward. And by the way, Teddy Roosevelt wasn't a perfect guy. He had a lot of issues as well. But the reason why we have all these national parks and a conservation legacy in this country is because of Teddy Roosevelt. And for that reason, I think he also deserves to be called a founder as well, just like the women that got my daughters the right to vote. And that's the way I think of every single one of you, which is why I care so much about the quality of your education, because the better your education, the better the contribution you're going to be able to make to our democracy and to our economy. Thanks for having me this morning. I really appreciate it. Great to see you. And we're going to get a quick photo with a shirt. Right over there. If you want to hold this side. Thank you. Great. This is a gift to you. Great. Thank you. Happy to have it. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Good luck, everybody.